Okay, so to continue with this, um, so the average rate of reaction, just to kind of go some, through some terminology here, when we say the average rate of reaction, okay, so essentially what you're doing is you're doing two data points and finding the slope between those two points, right? So change in y over change in x, which is what we had done in that first example. An instantine, instantaneous rate means that you are essentially finding the rate of reaction not over two points of time, but actually at one point in time. So instead of saying, okay, between one minute and four minutes, it could say, you know, what is the rate of reaction at 2.5 minutes, like the exact moment. In that case, you would have to do a tangent line from that data point, which if you remember, I'm sure you did this in math, that is not a great tangent line, but essentially you would draw a line that is touching that one data point on your curve, and you would then find the slope of that line that you just drew in. Okay, it's not as commonly done as the average rate, but just so you know the difference between those two terms and like how you could go about doing it. All right, so here's an example of a graph showing, in this case, by looking at where it's beginning, you can tell that this is for a product, right? So you start at zero and then we have a positive rate of reaction. So when you're looking at the speed of a reaction, in general, the steeper the slope of the line, the quicker the reaction is happening, right? That should make sense. You have a short amount of time and lots of that molecule being produced. As the reaction proceeds, the slope, right? You can compare that to this portion. This, the reaction slows down, and that's simply because there's not as much reactant available so obviously the production of the product will be slower because the reactant is not finding, um, like let's say you have two reactants, they're not finding one another um, as quickly because there's simply less of them colliding together because they've become product already. So when you're looking at um, any reaction actually, the beginning is always much quicker in comparison than towards the end. Okay, so we've already talked about this. So when we measure rates off a of graph, we describe them using a negative value for the reactants, a positive value for the products. And actually this is gonna go through this here. So um, here we have methane and chlorine. So then we have chloromethane and then hydrogen chloride. So this is actually a substitution reaction. You remember that from organic. Um, so let's say we were to talk about the reactants, right? So this is like change in methane over change in time. Notice a negative. If we were looking at chlorine, again, negative. If we were looking at the products, now we would be discussing a positive, right? We are producing HCl, we are producing CH3Cl. So um, this point down here is just to remind you of what we talked about before, and I've already kind of mentioned that. So negative rate means that it is being consumed. Positive rate, we are making it. Okay, so here's our second example. So this is where you now, let's say you have the rate of a reaction for one component. You can now use mole ratios to determine the concentration of the other components. So once you have the rate of one thing, you can find the rate for anything. So what is the rate of consumption of the reactants in a reaction that produces ammonia when the rate of production for ammonia is four moles per liter per second? So we have the rate of ammonia and we want to know the rate of the reactants consumption. Now, because there's two reactants, that means we're going to have to solve for the rate of each one. The rate value will not be the same, and we can tell right away because they are being used in different ratios. One nitrogen is being used for every three hydrogens. So the speed that these two things are gonna be used up by are gonna be different because we're using different quantities, right? So let's take a look. 
at this here. So remember the square brackets is a shorthand symbol for concentration. I use this quite a bit. So here's our reaction. We know the rate of ammonia. So we can use mole ratios to figure out these other two. So let's say we wanted to do the rate of nitrogen. So the rate of nitrogen, you would take the rate of ammonia and multiply by the ratio of nitrogen compared to ammonia. So what ends up happening is the ammonia cancels and we're left with units of nitrogen. So we have four moles per liter per second times one over two. So just to remind you where we're getting those numbers, those are the coefficients. One nitrogen is used for every two ammonia. So four times one divided by two, right? We get now two moles per liter per second, but remember we are now going to put that negative number in because this is a reactant. Now, if you prefer, you can set this up in the same way we set up mole ratios last year. Um, if you were comfortable using this way, please go ahead. Um, some of you I know might prefer to do it the old fashioned Miss Henson way of doing mole ratios and it will work the same way. So X is what we want to know the rate of. So we want to know the rate of nitrogen. On the bottom is the one we know the rate for. So 4.0. Oh, it's just four. I was gonna put times 10 to something. Anyway, okay. Let's get back to that. So 4.0, right? Moles per liter per second. This is for ammonia and H3. So whatever values in the numerator on one side, we put the coefficient for that numerator on the opposite side. <coughs> Excuse me. So if this is nitrogen, we're gonna put the coefficient of nitrogen which is a one. Over here we have the rate for ammonia. So underneath, we're gonna put the coefficient of ammonia, which is two. Okay, it works the same way. It's gonna be four times one divided by two. So you're doing cross multiplication to solve for X. So I actually don't mind which way you set this formula up, but at the end of the day, you're using mole ratios to figure out the ratio uh, I should say the rate of something else in that equation, right? So same thing down here. So we want to know the rate of the other reactant. The mole ratio is two to three, right? So whether you set it up this way or this way, right? We have moles, the rate for ammonia, it's three hydrogen for every two ammonia. We get that from the coefficients. The ammonia cancels out. We're left with now again, negative, because it's a reactant, 6.0 moles per liter per second. So if you set it up this way, you will still get the same um, response. So to key, the key to this is if you have a balanced chemical reaction and you know the rate of one component, doesn't matter if it's a reactant or a product, you can apply that to anything because we know mole ratios exist, right? Okay, so that's essentially 6.1, right? So looking at rate, different ways that rate can be calculated and looking at um, essentially, you know, looking at balanced chemical equations or graphs um, to determine the rate of a reaction. Okay, so the second section of chapter six looks at factors that can affect the rate of reaction. Um, to be honest, this is very redundant to what we have already done in grade 11 chemistry. So we're going to briefly go over some of the things that can affect reaction rate. Um, so the first one is the substance we're using, like the nature of the reactants. So meaning, um, naturally, some things react faster than others, right? Um, you can even look at trends on the periodic table to help explain this, right? So if you remember, um, as we go down a group, for example, metals become more reactive. So if I'm comparing lithium to sodium, sodium is lower in group one than lithium is. Sodium is just naturally more reactive than lithium. Uh, it's not like it's something we did to sodium for that to happen. It's just 
naturally that element is a faster reacting element in compared to lithium. So the nature of the, of the reactants is basically saying naturally some will react faster than others. <laughs> okay. Um, number two, concentration. So typically the higher the concentration of a reactant, um, the faster the rate will be. And that's simply because you are now increasing the number of collisions, right? So if we were to compare the left to the right, on the right hand side, we have more green and blue um, atoms. So they're going to collide with each other more. So the chance of having a successful collision are automatically higher. Temperature. So temperatures, obviously, taking a look at kinetic energy of molecules, we know that the higher the temperature is, the more particles are moving. So remember that to have a collision be successful, this is kind of a recap from grade 11. So when we say a collision is successful, two Cs. So when a collision is successful, that means two things have happened. There is a sufficient amount of energy when they collide. Okay, so the energy has to be, there's a specific amount of energy that has to be met. And if it's not met, it's not going to be successful. So you can have collisions happening, but you may not have a reaction. Okay, so it needs to have a sufficient amount of energy. And of course you need them to collide. Okay, so you need a collision and you need to have enough energy in that collision. So how temperature can affect a successful collision is it basically will increase the amount of energy that those particles have. So when they do collide, they'll have hopefully enough energy for that to now be a successful collision. Okay. Now, everything I'm talking to you about, like all these factors, is dependent on like the type of reaction. Like I'm talking very general, just like with everything else in chemistry, there are exceptions to rules. So I'm telling you that if I increase the temperature, the reaction will go faster, okay? But there might be some reactions that if you increase the temperature, it might go slower, right? Like we're talking in general, but I want you to have an understanding that Every reaction has its own specifications for what it requires for um, speed to be increased. So that being said, take this second point with a very um, big grain of salt. So this is saying as the temperatures increase, reaction rates increase. The reaction rate doubles approximately for every 10 degree rise in temperature. So meaning um, very generally, if you had to guess, or take a hypothesis as to what would happen to your rate. Um, this is kind of like a, um, a general criteria to go by. Does that mean every reaction, if I increase it by 10 degrees, it's going to double the rate? Absolutely not. Okay, you have to look at that specific reaction. And actually what we're gonna do tomorrow will give you a little bit more insight into that. So meaning, um, you could have a reaction that raising it by 10 degrees actually doesn't do much. Maybe it raises it only um, a quarter or um, one, a third faster, right? It doesn't have to always be double if you increase it by 10. This is just like a, you know, if you were forced to make a hypothesis as to what will happen, sure, we can go by this. Okay, surface area. So surface area obviously only applies if you're talking about solids, okay? So in general, if you lower the um, amount of available surface that a reaction is able to happen in, you will have a slower rate. If you allow for more spots for a collision to happen, so if you make your surface area larger, or think of it as the particles are smaller, um, you will have more availability for collisions to happen. And if they're colliding more, chances are they will be successful uh, naturally more. 